Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to present uh, this paper. Um, this is a paper about when growth began. It's joint work with Paul Buscas, uh, who's now at uh, University of Cambridge and will be at Sciences Po uh, uh, in the summer, and, and with Emi Nakamura. Um, so, you know, the traditional, there, there's, you know, there's several different views about when growth began. I think a traditional view is that growth, modern growth, began with the Industrial Revolution, so around 1800. Um, but, but recent scholarship has been pushing this idea back that, and, and arguing that there was growth before the Industrial Revolution. So an alternative view is that uh, growth began with the first great divergence, which, uh, you know, Asimoglu, Johnson, and Robinson, for example, talk about as, as having occurred uh, after 1500, after the great discoveries of the, of the Americas and the sea route to India. Um, and that, so so that, would, that would date kind of the crucial moment when growth began around 1500. And then there are views where, where uh, people argue that growth began even earlier. So uh, one example is, of that is that Stephen Broadberry and co-authors have recently compiled a, uh, a series for GDP per capita for England that goes back to the 13th century to 1270. And if you look at that series, it has modest growth um, all the way to the beginning of the series. So if you look at that, it, it looks like growth began even earlier, uh, maybe in the 13th century, maybe even earlier. And then, of course, there's the work by Michael Kramer that argues that, you know, looking at population growth, that there must have been some growth, um, of, you know, for glacially slow growth in that case uh, for, for a very, very long time, hundreds of thousands of years. Okay, so there's, you know, various views. Um, one thing that is kind of somewhat difficult about wrapping your head around this debate is that people are sometimes talking about different concepts. Um, it's not the same whether GDP per capita is growing versus productivity is growing versus GDP is growing and so on. So I'm going to be very precise about what we're going to be after in this paper. And that is that we're going to be thinking about whether when productivity growth uh, began. So think of this as TFP growth. Okay, our, mind, our main finding is going to be that there was no productivity growth before 1600. We're going to be looking at a period from 1250 to 1860. And so in the first um, uh, 350 years of our data, we see no productivity growth. Um, and then productivity growth begins around 1600, and it's relatively modest early on at 3% per decade and then increases around the time of the Industrial Revolution uh, to something like 6% per decade. And, and it's 6% per decade on average from, from 1760 to 1860. Now, 6% per decade is, is a fairly low number um, relative to modern growth, which is more like 20 or 25% per decade. Um, so you might be surprised that there was so, much, so little productivity growth uh, during these first 100 years after the onset of the Industrial Revolution, but that, occurs in our model because we as, th there was much more growth in the actual economy. So it's productivity growth that is, that is fairly modest, but the, the economy is actually growing uh, much, much faster. And we ascribe a lot of that extra growth after 1760, not to productivity growth, but rather to uh, a falling land share of production. And I'll, I'll talk a lot about that as we, as we go along. Okay. Now, why is this an interesting thing to study? Well, one reason why we think this is an interesting thing to study is that it sheds fresh light, I think, on why growth began. Why growth began is, is truly a momentously important question. Um, and um, and we, we hope that this sheds light on that. So we are dating the onset of productivity growth at 1600. Um, one thing that's interesting about that date is that it's, a, it's about 100 years prior to the Glorious Revolution in, in England. It's, it's about 50 years prior to... Uh, the Civil War in England. So, you know, there, one of the kind of big debates about growth has to do with changes in institutions. And there's one viewpoint in that literature that the bourgeois revolutions that occurred in the 17th century in England were crucial to the onset of growth. And, and people talk mostly about the Glorious Revolution, but, but if you're more of a Marxist historian, you would talk about the, the Civil War as being important. But here we're dating growth 
to, a, to ha, as having started earlier than that. So if you want to look at the real seeds of growth, you need to look at events that are prior to these. I'm not saying those events are not important, but I'm saying the seeds of growth uh, occur earlier than, than those revolutions. Okay? And, and, you know, maybe the Marxist view that the, that the economic changes that are occurring are actually causing those revolutions to happen. Maybe, that, maybe our evidence suggests that that is true. Okay, so here what I'm showing you, just to kind of fix ideas, is I'm showing you our estimates of productivity. So the, the solid black line here, this one here, this is, this is our estimate of productivity in England. Okay, and so you can see that there are some modest fluctuations prior to 1600, but productivity in 1600 is not that different from what it was in the late 13th century, and then it, then it starts to grow after that. And I'm contrasting our estimates here in this picture with some prior estimates of productivity growth in England. Now, the most comprehensive prior estimate of productivity growth in England um, is an estimate by Greg Clark. Um, and so that's this broken uh, black line here. Okay, And so originally, uh, Greg put this, this series or a series very similar to this one uh, out in a paper in 2010, and, and that's maybe a better known paper, but I'm citing a version in 2016 where Greg uh, updated the series and, 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 and fixed an, an error in his earlier series. Um, now, the important thing here is that our estimate is, is, is quite different from Greg's estimate. So in particular, one of the odd things about Greg's estimate of productivity growth is it looks in his, according to his estimates, as if productivity in England around 1850 is very similar to productivity in England in 1450, which is really odd. Like if you read kind of, uh, kind of anecdotal accounts of the English economy, you would not think that the English economy in 1850 had a similar productivity as in 1450. So, so this series kind of on the face of it, if you just kind of read history casually, seems very odd. And, and actually Clark comments on that and says that, you know, this is a pretty odd conclusion to come to. Now, obviously, we come to a very different conclusion, and our conclusion is, is more similar to other kind of less comprehensive estimates of productivity. So I, I also have these diamonds here in the picture, which are estimates by uh, Robert Allen of productivity growth, not in the whole economy, but rather in the agricultural sector. And, 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 and those estimates suggest much more productivity growth, much more in line with uh, kind of what... Uh, you know, casually you would think is true about the English economy. So let, let me stop and see if there are any questions. John, and so do, do you have any conjecture about what made this change at that point in time? If, if not oh, the, oh, so why, why did productivity growth begin in 1600? Yeah, exactly. I mean, was there anything, is there anything that you can associate with what you're looking in the data that would tell you about Sort of what changed at that point? So, so I, I can speculate about what happened around 1600, but um, it's not going to be kind of the data that we use is not going to, I think, directly tell us about the causes. You know, there are many things that are going on that might be considered to be special around that time. Um, one is that um, th there's a, there's a, 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 a kind of a large amount of ex, uh, of increase in international trade that is occurring around that time. So the population of London is exploding around that time um, for some reason, probably because international trade is, is expanding very rapidly at that time. So that's something special. Um, another thing that is special is that the reformation occurs uh, a little bit prior to this. And the reformation is a, is a vast kind of institutional change. Um, it leads to very large changes in the land market in England because Henry VIII, you know, uh, seizes the monasteries and then sells them off. And, and, and basically you get a new class of landowners in England that may be much more capitalist than, than prior landowners. That's one. That's another thing. You also get much more freedom of expression in England after the Reformation. So uh, Voltaire talks about England as the land of liberty because there's free expression in England. Uh, to a greater extent than in France or, or Catholic, uh, Catholic continent, continental England. Um, so there, are, you know, there's a huge rise in literacy that is occurring because after 
the on, you know, when, when the printing press um, is invented, which is, you know, 150 years earlier, um, um, you know, basically people can, can make books much more cheaply, and this gives people an incentive to learn how to read. And so, um, so literacy is, is rising very rapidly around this time. So there, there are quite a few things. Robert Allen in his book about uh, enclosure in the yeoman talks about this period also as being a period when, um, when the yeoman farmers in England had kind of acquired a proprietary interest in, in their land. Kind of it's a, there's, this is a period where there's a breakdown of feudalism in, in England. Um, uh, and so, so I, I can point to, to a number of things that are plausible hypotheses for why this would be an important time. You know, if you ask me, could I go to some other date and also point to five things that were special about some other date, probably I could do that too, okay? But those are the ones that come to mind around, around this period. But what, what I can say is that our estimates suggest that you should be thinking about things that happened around that time. They, they seem to be more special according to, you know, this economic data that I'm using than, than, than things that occur at other times. So what's, sorry, so, sorry, so a follow up on that. So what's a bit surprising is that you don't see like a break or like a change in trend afterwards. It's, it seems like there's almost like a linear sort of fit after 1600, which sort of tells you that really there's something that was going on that sort of discontinually changed things more, relatively more than the events that we know had, that happened later. Yeah, yeah, so there is a bit of a break around in the late 18th century. So it's harder to see because the series I is see. kind of growing fast enough that you can't see it well. But there, there is a break of growth around this point. Sorry, but, okay. but that's true. Um, um, that's kind of what I was saying on the first slide. That, that, um, uh, and that has to do with the fact that we're going to ascribe a lot of the growth in the, in the late 18th century, early 19th century to a fall in the land share as opposed to an increase in productivity. But yeah. Okay. So a couple of uh, uh, further comments. So one mm -hmm. is from your reading on, on, on events or things going on in that episode, is any form of development of the financial market one of the possible candidates? So, so uh, that is a very controversial issue. Okay, so you know, if you read North and Weingast, so the kind of traditional glorious revolution guys, they will point to a financial revolution that occurred after the glorious revolution. Okay. Now that is a hotly debated topic. Okay. Now it is true that in for prior to the glorious revolution, th there was a rise of, of goldsmith bankers in England. So there was some kind of banking starting to occur in England that had not been in England before, but you know, England is very special when it comes to the Industrial Revolution. The, the Industrial Revolution really happened in England, did not happen in Holland, it did not happen in Milan, it did not happen in Paris, okay? It happened in England, okay? But if you think about banking, banking is not that special in England. The, the kind of, the, the merchants in Northern Italy, they were doing more advanced banking earlier. The Bank of Amsterdam is, is by far the most innovative institution you know, prior to this episode in terms of payment systems. Um, so it's not so obvious that England is, is special when it comes to finance until quite a bit later, okay? So, you know, the Bank of England is a, is a pretty special institution. Now, people, are, people debate that because, you know, there's a view um, that, that opposes this North and Wine guest view, which argues that the financial revolution in England was about financing the state. So the state was able to finance itself. It was able to finance wars. It won a bunch of wars after this because it had easy access to capital. But people will argue that this was at the expense of, of the rest of the economy. The state was monopolizing everything, you know, and, and was putting in place all kinds of institutions that made it difficult for the private sector to finance itself through banks. This is a debate that I haven't kind of fully um, figured out what I think about yet. But, um, you know, to a first order, I would say that that would not be at the top of my list, um, finance in this, in this case. But, but, you know, maybe I'm wrong about that. Okay, so the second question is about the, this comparison that you do with, with the Clark series. Mm 
Are you gonna tell us the difference between your series? Yeah, yeah. And... So that's the next okay. step. Let me let me get to that. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. So obviously, it's kind of interesting that we're getting different conclusions from Clark. Let's, so let's talk about why that is. Okay. Now, you know, clearly it has something to do with some combination of the data that we use and the method that we use to calculate productivity. So let's go through the way in which productivity is usually calculated. Okay, so the traditional way this is done in post-World World War II data is what I'm going to call here the primal approach, you know, which is to calculate a solo residual, um, taking output growth and subtracting a weighted average of input growth. So this is the typical thing you would teach your undergraduates about how to calculate productivity. Okay, and this is how we do it. In, in, in modern data. Now, there's some difficulties in doing this with historical data. Um, and these have to do with you know, just having data on the different objects here on the right-hand side of this equation. It, you know, it's difficult to construct GDP, for example, way back in time. GDP is a very complicated con you know, thing to calculate. It's also very difficult to construct a capital series way back in time. And in addition to that, you know, in modern data, the, we use the, the national income and product accounts both to get, you know, these two series, but also to calculate the labor share and the capital share. Okay. And so it's also difficult to figure out what the labor share and the capital share is way back in, you know, for hundreds and hundreds of years prior to the Industrial Revolution. You can't just use one third, two thirds. It's like, it's very different. There was a huge land share. You have no idea what it is. So, so all of that is difficult. Okay. Now, you can, you can bypass some of these problems by using what's called the dual approach. Okay, so the dual approach was, for example, used by Chang Tai She in a paper in 2002, thinking about the, the, the Asian growth miracle. Okay, and this is the approach that, that, that Clark is using in those papers that, you know, in, in the series over here. Okay, so he's using the dual approach. So instead of, instead of using the quantities, we're using the prices. And, um, there's easy math to get from here to here. And basically, according to the dual approach, the change in productivity is a weighted average of the change in real factor prices. Okay, and the advantage of this is that it's easier to get factor price data way back in time than it is to get quantities way back in time. Okay, so that's why the historians sometimes use this dual approach. Now, that solves some of the problems, but it doesn't solve them all. And one of the big issues is that you still need these factor shares. And so how are you gonna get these factor shares? Well, you know, ultimately you have to come up with some version of a NIPA accounting to get these factor shares if you're gonna do this approach. And that's what Clark does, okay? So we think that one of the things that, you know, we've actually kind of worked pretty hard on understanding how our thing differs from his. And, and part of the answer is that these factor shares are different. The factor shares we're gonna come up with are different from his. And then also his estimate relies not only on the real wage, which we're gonna argue is pretty well measured, but also on the, the, the pr price of capital and the price of land, okay? And in particular, the, the series he uses for the price of land going back in time is very noisy. And, and we think that that series is, is lower quality than the series we're gonna use and contributes to getting these strange results. Okay, so we're not gonna use either of these methods. We're gonna use a different method. Okay, so let me talk about what method we're gonna use. Now to illustrate how our method works, I think it's kind of easiest to understand it by, by working through this picture here. Okay, so what am I plotting on this figure? I've got on the x-axis labor supply in England. Okay, now if you wanna think about this x-axis just as the population, that's fine. Think about it as the population. So actually there are two things that are going into this x-axis. It's the population and also days worked per worker. But for now you can ignore the second one. So think of this as the population of England. And then on the y-axis I have real wages, okay? And so what I'm showing you here is, is a scatter plot, you know, over time of these two variables. So, so the, the picture starts here, this is 1250. And so from 1250 to 1300, the economy moves in, you know, down like this. So the population increases and real wages fall. And then from 1300, the population decreases and real wages increase. So this has a lot to do with plagues. Okay, so there are a lot of plagues that are hitting the economy. This is crushing the population. And as that's happening, 
real wages increase. Okay, so the big thing is, is this one here. This, this is the Black Death, okay? Uh, but there are other plagues, and there are basically population headwinds on the economy for this 150-year period. And then after 1450, the population starts to recover. So these plagues kind of die down, um, and the population starts to recover, and the economy moves back down. And this is 1600, and this is 1630. Okay, so you can see in 1630, the economy is in almost exactly the same spot as it was in 1300. Okay, now what this looks like to us is an economy that's moving up and down a stable labor demand curve. Okay, if the labor demand curve were shifting, then you couldn't get back to the same point in 1630 as you were at 1300 because the curve would be somewhere way to the, to the right. Okay. But, given, but if the curve is not shifting, then there's no productivity growth. You know, it's productivity growth is shifts in the labor demand curve. So we're going to use a method that basically infers productivity by estimating the slope of a labor demand curve and then backing out productivity growth as shocks, as kind of movements in that um, labor demand curve. So basically, we're going to conclude the economy is moving up and down a fairly stable labor demand curve prior to 1600. And then it starts, you know, that curve starts shifting out. The points start shifting off that earlier labor demand curve, suggesting that labor demand is, is moving out, and that's productivity growth. John, one quick yeah. question here. How, how do you measure real wages in, for, for these dates? Yeah, so we are, we are using, I mean, there's been a massive effort by economic historians to, to measure real wages um, in various countries, but in particular in England, over long periods of time. And we're taking kind of um, the best, or in, in our uh, assessment, the best series on real wages, which is actually constructed by Greg Clark. Okay, now, how is that done? Well, uh, there are two components to real wages. There's nominal wages and there's prices. The nominal wages are coming, so we're going to be using building workers. So these are people that are building cathedrals and building the colleges in Oxford and building churches all over England and, you know, those kinds of work. It's basically building workers, okay? So you get the day wages of those guys over time. And then you have to construct a price index. And so you have, you know, you're trying to measure the prices of various things and con construct a price index. So that's like wheat and candles and beer and those kinds of things, you know. Um, and you construct a price index and then it's, you know, W over P. That's the kind of basics, you know. Um, and, and, and this is a big activity in economic history to construct a series like this. And we're just going to be using uh, what we think of as the best series uh, on this. But we, you know, in the appendix to the paper, I compare various different uh, series for real wages in England. Sorry, very quickly, just some clarification. Mm -hmm. This logic that you are applying allows you to extract information about uh, labor productivity, and TFP is one component of it. No, 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 so no, 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 no. This is, so it's TFP shows up in the labor demand curve. Okay, so let, let me go to the math. Okay? Capital two. Let's talk about capital two, no? Yeah, yeah, so if the model has capital, okay, so this is a simple version, okay? The, the model at the end is going to have capital as well. Capital is not that important prior to the Industrial Revolution, okay? But the model is going to have capital. Okay, but let's think of a, a, an economy that, uh, that, you know, for simplicity right now, that, that doesn't have capital. It has a land, okay? Z is land. That's in fixed supply. And then there's labor, okay? And so this is the marginal product of labor, and this is the wage. And we're going to be equalizing the marginal product of labor to... To, to, to the wage, okay? And then A is TFP, okay? Not labor productivity. Okay, so then suppose I take logs of this equation and I, and I get this equation. And then if you were really simple-minded, you would say, well, okay, so with this, I can just regress wages on, on labor, and then the residual in my regression would be A, and that would be my measure of productivity. Now, that's not actually going to work very well. And the reason for that is that Arguably, the economy here is a Malthusian economy, okay? And so changes in A are going to induce changes in labor. You know, if people get richer, they have more babies in a, in a Malthusian economy. And so changes in A are going to 
lead L to change. And so that's going to create a correlation between A and L and going to mean that our estimate of alpha would be biased if we did this by OLS. So what we're going to do instead of running this regression by OLS, and you, you can see that, you know, if you tried to estimate this equation on this part of the data, you would get the wrong sign, you know, because the endogeneity bias is so large, okay? So, um, so what we're going to do instead of, of estimating this regression by OLS is that we're going to write down a full Malthusian model that has both this labor demand curve and also a process for labor supply. So we're going to model the endogeneity and we're going to estimate that whole model structurally. Um, and, and in that way, back out hopefully a sensible estimate of alpha and a sensible estimate of the change in A over time. Okay. So let, let me, please, could you go back one? Mm -hmm. uh, so this is exactly what, what I was saying before. So when Z is constant, the mm -hmm. only way that a wage can move is because of TFP or labor supply. And then there is all this discussion about incorporating labor in the endogeneity of labor supply. That's, that's mm -hmm. fine. Mm -hmm. But land is fixed. So mm -hmm. how land on capital, to, be, to say it more broadly, is, can be fixed in so many centuries? So for instance, I can imagine that land in the 15th century, 16th century, the type of land that could be used was much more limited than the type of land that can be used two centuries later. And the same thing is going to apply for capital. Uh, capital is not going to be fixed across centuries. Uh, so no, that's no, 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 right, 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 right. I, so, okay, so wait a minute. So, so the model is going to have capital, okay? And now, the other part about the land, so, so you're talking about improvements in land, okay? Improvements in land are going to be measured as part of the capital stock. If you invest in a machine, that's part of the capital stock. If you invest in a ditch to, to, to drain some land so that you can use a land that was pr previously a swamp, that is also going to be a part of the capital stock. Okay, so all of that investment is going to be measured in the capital stock in, in our model. You know, obviously, you know, it's a broad brush model and maybe we're making heroic assumptions that we can do this, but, but, but conceptually, we are going to capture that through capital. Okay, thanks. Okay, so what, what we're going to get out of this is something it's not possible to use as instrument the black or the black like, as an instrument here because. Yeah, yeah, so I'm not going to do that. Okay, now I agree with the, I agree with the thought. Okay, that would be in some sense cleaner. All right. Now, there are two concerns I have with doing it that way. One is that you know, some of the more major plagues, you know, you can identify them, like the Black Death, okay? But a lot of these population headwinds are kind of smaller things that are harder, it's harder to figure out when there's a, when there's a real plague and when there's not. You know, there are all kinds of things occurring um, in various places and so on. And, so, you know, not all of these things are plagues. There can be like ty typhoid or various other illnesses and stuff that are, that are affecting people. So, I think, first of all, I would lose a lot of power if I tried to only use identifiable plagues. The other thing is even more tricky. Okay, so it's really important for me to get the slope of this labor demand curve correct. You know, because if I get a slope that's too small, then this is all going to look like shifts in labor, shifts in labor demand up and then shifts back. Okay, and if you go back to Clark's series, that's what it looks like. It looks like productivity growth is rising and then falling, okay? That would be the case if I had too small a slope of the labor, sorry, if I had, you know, if the labor demand curve was not steep enough, then it would have to be shifting up and shifting down. Now, if you look in particular at the decade of the Black Death, you can see that that suggests a, a curve that is not as steep as the whole point of lines. Now, why is that, okay? So you could say, oh, this suggests that you're doing things wrong. Okay, that's, that's correct. It does suggest that. Now, I think that, I think that if you read the history of this period, there is a reason why this is the case. Okay, so the Black Death occurs, and the feudal lords are very powerful at this time, and they don't want the wages to rise. So they put in place laws called the Statute of Laborers to ban wage increases. Okay, and this works for a while. 
Okay, but eventually it breaks down and there are peasant revolts and blah, 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 and eventually wages rise. But it takes some time for the wages to rise, okay? And if I were to estimate things only off of the short run, I think I would get things wrong because the feudal lords were able to keep the wages low for some, you know, a few decades, okay? And so that's also something that is messy and makes using the IV approach uh, more difficult. So for those two reasons, we did not go with the IV approach, even though obviously it's kind of like cleaner. We're going to go with a structural approach. So you're going to have to kind of believe the whole model. That's a downside, but it gives us more power and we don't have to get into the details of, of this, you know, these kinds of kind of timing issues. Okay, so, so what we get out of this, we get out, yeah, yeah. Uh, from the bank, I have a question uh, uh, regarding to the, the, the beginning of the British Empire. So I, I, I'm breaking up a lot. I, I'm having trouble hearing the question. Yeah, yeah the audio is not very good for some reason. Oh, sorry. Um, let me think. Oh, sorry. Now I can't hear you at all. One small thing in the meantime, do you have concerns about the, the slope actually changing over time, given all the things that were happening, you know? Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. So this is hitting on a bunch of things that we would have talked about oh, later, but- Maybe, so, yeah, if you wanna- No, no, no I, I can talk about it, it's important, okay? So one thing is that, that you know, our sample period, it's not all pre-industrial. Part of our sample period goes into the, the, the kind of early industrial era. Now, in this model, okay, so if, if you remember how this, where's my, uh, okay, so in this kind of a model, this alpha here, it's the, it, like if this was Cobb Douglas, it would be the coefficient on land, okay? And so basically I'm assuming here implicitly that the coefficient on land um, is constant, all right? So that's the land share. So that might make sense in pre-industrial England, but once you get into the last 100 years of the data, it, that's not a good assumption. You want to allow the land share to fall, you know, as the economy industrializes, as steam power and coal. So the, the, the main thing, what's, what's going on when, when you industrialize is that it used to be that energy production was very land intensive. But then you have fossil fuels and energy production becomes um, very non-land intensive because, you know, you can just have a, 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 you know, a steam engine and you don't need much land. You can produce an enormous amount of energy. Okay, so the land share falls enormously once, once that happens. And so we want to allow for that. And, and that's going to be a part of, part of the analysis. Um, okay, so can somebody read, I think? Um, yeah, so Mario asked in the chat, the question is regarding the beginning of the British Empire around 1600, if you deal and take into account that in some way. Yeah, so I think, you know, sometimes this question is asked in, a, in the following way. Didn't England effectively have more land after it started, you know, colonizing other areas? Okay. And so it's true. In, in our situation, to the extent that they are, they are kind of plundering other regions, okay, which is, you know, arguably true that they're, you know, if it was just people moved to Ireland and then they use that land, well, then the people are not in our analysis, the land is not in our analysis, fine, okay, if they have balanced trade, whatever, it doesn't, that wouldn't be much of a, of a problem. But if they're really plundering the other regions, then they're making use of the other land, okay, in a way that is outside of the framework that I've Put, put on the table. And so that, like, like everything else that's not in the model, you know, A is a residual, and A is going to capture these, these other things, okay? So some of the increase in A may be the fact that they now have a, a technology for piracy and for privateering and plundering and colonization and so on. So, so, so that is true, that it, it, would, it would affect that. Okay, so, um, so we're gonna have arguably two interesting outcomes. We're gonna have a new productivity series for England, which I've already shown you. And then we're gonna also have estimates of the strength 
of the Malthusian forces in pre-industrial England. Okay, so this endogeneity, when, when people get richer, how many babies do they have? We're gonna have an estimate of the strength of those forces, right? And so we're gonna estimate those forces to be fairly weak. Uh, quantitatively, a doubling of real income is gonna lead to an increase in population of growth of only 6% per decade. The fact that this is so weak, you know, if, if you think about 20th century differences in, in population growth across countries and time, they're way, way larger than that. So this is fairly small. This is gonna mean that, that the half-life of a population shock is very long, something like 170 years. So in the history literature, this is often called weak homeostasis. Um, and then, you know, once industrialization uh, occurs, this is gonna become even weaker. And, and, you know, in the modern era, these Malthusian forces are, are so weak that we ignore them completely. Um, okay, but this means that since these forces are so weak, our model is consistent with persistent deviations from the quote unquote iron law of wages. So a very simplistic view of Malthusian economics is that wages are always stuck at subsistence. But if you have this kind of weak Malthusian forces, then productivity growth, modest productivity growth, which is pushing wages up, they can more than overwhelm the, the forces that are pushing wages down and you can have kind of golden ages or what historians sometimes call, call efflorescences. You know, so ancient Rome or ancient Greek or, or Song China or so on were periods where arguably there was more prosperity and it lasted for hundreds of years. Um, and our model, since these Malthusian forces are, are pretty weak, are, are consistent. Um, with those kinds of episodes. Okay, so unless there are other questions, uh, let me stop just and see if there are other questions, but, but I'm then gonna dive into the model. Okay, so let me write down a model of, 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 of a Malthusian economy. And this is gonna have fairly elementary features, so I'm gonna go fairly fast because I think people are gonna think this is pretty, they're gonna have seen this before. Okay, so here's the production function. Okay, so it's a Cobb-Douglas production function in three inputs. So output is made with land, which is in fixed supply, capital, and labor. And then we're going to assume that, you know, kind of markets are perfect. And, and so wages are equal to the marginal product of labor. Um, the margin, you know, the interest rate or the return on capital is equal to the marginal product of capital. Now, one of the problems that we have is that we don't have good data on capital. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna plug this equation into this equation and solve out for K. And so when we do that, we get an equation, which is a version of the labor demand curve where we've plugged the labor, sorry, the capital demand curve into the labor demand curve and eliminated K. And now labor demand is a function of, of the interest rate in addition to labor, okay? So we're not gonna use data on capital prior to 1760. We're gonna use data on capital after 1760 for reasons I'll come to. Uh, but before that, we're only gonna use data on wages, uh, the population, and, and uh, the return on capital. So that, this is labor demand, okay? The other side of the model is labor supply. And so we're gonna assume that, that labor supply is given by two things. It's the number of people in the economy and how many days per year they work. So D is days worked per, per worker. Okay, so we have some data on days worked per worker and we're gonna assume that's exogenous. And then we're gonna model the population. Okay, so this is like a core element of any Malthusian model, which is that the growth in the population is a function of income. So if people are richer, so income is wages times the number of days they work. So this is real income. And so we're gonna say that population growth is, growth is increasing in real income with some elasticity gamma. And this elasticity gamma is now capturing what you know, the Malthusian guys would call um, the, all the check, you know, there, there are these positive checks and preventative checks on the population. If you've read about Malthusian stuff, all of that stuff is, is encapsulated in this gamma. It's the elasticity of population growth with respect to real income. All right, John. Yeah. Uh, can I ask a question? Um, is there a lot of variation in days worked per year? I mean, yeah, I, there, I would imagine there is. That, like into the Industrial Revolution, I think people were working more days. I don't know how it was before. Like people were yeah. always working six days a week. I'll show you that. It's, it's quite an interesting series. 
Um, we can talk about it when I, let's come back to it when I show you the series. Right. But it's, it's, it's a very interesting series. So it plays sure. some role in the results to have the, to use this series. Um, okay, so, so on the labor demand side over here, I had a shock and that was, that's, so that's the, la that's the productivity shocks. That's a shock to labor demand. And then on the labor supply side, I'm also going to have a shock. So those are the labor supply shocks. Okay. And those are going to be, for example, the plagues. So plagues are going to kill people, right? And those are going to be in this Xi thing. All right. So, um, so I'm going to have labor demand shocks and labor supply shocks and, and, and part of you know, being able to estimate the model is that there are a lot of labor supply shocks that are allowing me to trace out the labor demand curve. Now, as I said before, um, our, our sample period extends into the early industrial period. So I want to allow the factor shares to change in the early industrial period. So I'm gonna allow these alphas and betas here to, to be time varying after the onset of the industrial revolution. And at that point, I have to start estimating those guys period by period. So I need more data to do that. So after 1760, I need two more data series to be able to pin down two more objects that are changing over time. And those two new data series um, are going to be uh, the rental rate on land and the amount of capital in the economy. Okay, but prior to 1760, I'm not, you know, we, we only have data on capital uh, after 1760. Um, and so that's when I start, you know, allowing for this. But it's also like a very conventional date to, to date the industrial revolution. So, so it all works out uh, in that sense. Okay. Now, a complication that arises when I start allowing the product production. So this is like structural change. Okay. And, and a, compu a complication that arises when you allow for structural transformation is, is that A, you know, so if these is if these exponents are constants, then A is the obvious measure of productivity in the economy. Any kind of sensible way in which you could conceptualize what productivity was, it would always be A in that case. But when these alphas or betas are changing, A is not, no longer a sensible measure of productivity. Actually, you know, if you were to use A as your measure of productivity, it wouldn't make any sense because you could renormalize L and that would change your, your A, okay? And, and so things are sense, you know, if you were using A, it would be sensitive to the units you used on the other variable. So it would, you know, you get basically nonsense if you try to use A as your measure of productivity when you have a model with this kind of st structural transformation. So we have to basically, you know, so usually we do stuff like this. There's, there's an A and then there's a function that's not changing over time. And in that case, A is the obvious measure of productivity. Here we have a function that is changing, okay? Because in our case, the alphas and betas are changing. And so A is no longer the right measure of productivity. So what is a good measure of productivity? Well, there's a literature on this. So we're following this paper by Caves, Christensen, and, and Deworth uh, from 1982. They propose a measure of productivity based on the work of Malmquist. So this is often called a Malmquist index. And, and they argue that this is a sensible way of measuring productivity. So we're going to measure productivity using this Malmquist index. Now, if, if alpha and beta are constant, then the change in the Malmquist index is the same as the change in A, but, but this Malmquist index retains the kind of nice properties of productivity, even in a, in a model with structural transformation. Okay, so that's a complication that we have to, have to take account of. Kind of a technical thing. Okay, now, since I'm gonna do this with structural estimation, I have to kind of specify everything about the model. In particular, I have to specify um, the process for productivity. So I'm going to assume productivity uh, is, is made up of two components. I'm calling productivity M here based on this Malmquist thing as opposed to A. Um, and so it has two components. There's a transitory shock to productivity and there's a permanent, so there's a random walk component to productivity and there's a transitory component to productivity. Now this, this mu here is the average growth rate of productivity. So this is in some sense the coefficient I'm really interested in estimating. If, if mu is zero, there's no average productivity growth. If mu is positive, there's average productivity growth. So we're gonna allow this mu here to, to break at a few points in time and then estimate the size of those breaks and the date of those breaks. That's gonna be like 
our way of conceptualizing our test of when uh, growth began. So that's productivity. And then on the population shock side, side we're going to assume that there are two types of po population shocks. There are, there's these uh, Xi1, which are plagues. And so plagues occur occasionally. So with some probability, there's a plague. And then some you know, sizable fraction of the population dies. And the fraction of the population that's left is, is modeled as a beta distribution. Um, or sorry, the fraction of the population that is killed is modeled as a beta distribution. And then with some complementary probability, the plague doesn't occur and, and nobody is killed by the plague. Um, and then we also allow for some normal kind of uh, symmetric uh, labor supply shock. Okay, so that's the whole model. Okay, so let me just like walk through how this model works um, just so that everybody's on the same page. So this is the labor demand curve in the model. Suppose we start at this point A and there's a plague that occurs. So the plague kills a bunch of people. So the economy moves. Can I ask you something about the, the shock, the plague shock? How long it take it? It have a it's one period shock or is 10 year shocks? How do you measure that? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Okay, so the data is gonna be in decades. So each okay. point is a decade. And so, yeah, so this shock occurs over, a, in some sense, over a decade. Okay, so it's one time. Okay, so, so the plague occurs, it kills a bunch of people, you move up the labor demand curve, and then, you know, since real wages are higher, people start having more babies, and the, and the population um, recovers over time. That's the dynamics of the model when there's a plague shock. Now, contrast that with a productivity shock. Okay, so again, the economy starts at a point A, but a productivity shock shifts the labor demand curve. Right, so you start by moving up, and then, of course, because real wages are high, people have more babies, and you move to a point C. So the dynamics of the model are different after a population shock than after a productivity shock. And, and it's, what we're trying to do is distinguish between the you know, productivity, what's coming from the labor demand shocks, the productivity shocks, and what's coming from the labor supply shocks. And so it's the fact that these dynamics are different that allows us to identify these two things um, structurally. So this is why the model is identified. Okay, so data. Um, so we're gonna use this series of, uh, of data um, for our estimation. Um, so it's real wages of unskilled building workers. So this is the series of, uh, of real wages in England um, from 1250 to 1600. It's, it's, it's an interesting series, you know, so you have this gigantic increase in real wages in the 14th and 15th century, then a really big fall, and then nothing is happening for a while, and then a big increase at the end of the series. Now, you know, if you didn't know anything about history um, and you were kind of schooled in 20th century or 21st century economics, you, you might equate real wages and productivity. Like in our models, usually real wages and productivity are, are very similar objects because we usually use models that have constant returns to scale. And then you would think, whoa, productivity must have increased and then fallen a lot. Um, but, but really what's going on here, you know, through the lens of our model is that this is due to the plagues you know, the, the population is being crushed and that's re raising real wages and then the population is recovering. Okay, so we're able to kind of move from this real wage series to a productivity series by taking account of the movements in, in population. So this is the real wage series. I'm happy to take questions actually uh, at this point. The population data we're using here, I'm plotting the population data we're using. The population data after 1540 is kind of Every, you know, the historians agree is high quality. Um, before 1540, it's not as high quality. Now, what we're using is some data from Clark. Um, and, and there's a, you know, there's, there are two complications. We're missing one data point, And we have to, you know, the level of these series is not the same. I'm plotting them as, as being equal to each other right here. But that's, you know, you have to estimate that. This is kind of not comparable to this. Okay, so, so those are complications we have to, use the model to solve, but you know, we're using this kind of trend of population. We don't know the level of population prior to 1540 um, uh, from this Clark paper, and then we're using the standard uh, population data after 1540. So here's the days worked per, per worker um, series that uh, I got a question about earlier. Okay, so this is 
a pretty interesting series, okay? It's very different from, from being constant, okay? So there's a, one of the strands of the literature on England uh, talks about what's called an industrious revolution. Jan de Vere's, you know, has, has written famous kind of books and papers about this, the industrious revolution. And he was talking about this period. And yes, this kind of very recent series on days worked for work, uh, days worked per worker, um, suggests that there was indeed a very strong industrious revolution in this period. But actually, the series suggests that that was going on all the way back to the, the Black Death. So days worked fell a lot at the time of the Black Death, and then started this march upward that was extremely large. Okay. Now, two things about this series. These movements seem a bit extreme to me. You know, 100 days per year is very low. 350 days per year is very high. Um, so, you know, you can be a little bit skeptical. Maybe this overstates these differences a bit. A lot of people in this literature, instead of using a series like this, this is a fairly recent series, would just assume a constant day's work. Now, you know, I think this, even if you don't kind of totally believe the amplitude of this movement, I think this does suggest that using a constant day's work is not the right approach. But in the appendix, we have done the analysis with a constant day's work instead of using this series. Um, here's our data on rates of return on, on uh, asset rates of return. So we're going to use this as a proxy for the rate of return on capital. So these are return on land and, and return on what's called rent charges. Rent charges is basically like a collateralized loan. Um, and, and so, you know, you see that these rates of return came down and then they were fairly stable and then they came down a little bit more. So this is the data we're going to use on that. And we're going to allow for measurement error in all of our data. And that's one of the kind of uh, nice things about doing this using the methodology that we do, that we can, we can allow for measurement error in all the data. And obviously, you know, there's a measurement error in this data. Um, and, and, then, and what's the, sorry, and what's the data underlying the return on land? This is like, you see, you have like information on, on, on yeah, so you have information on the of land rental or... rate of the land and the price of the land. And the, this is kind of R over P, where R is the, so s suppose there's some piece of land and it earns the owner of the land, you know, three pounds per year. And then occasionally the land is sold and it's sold, say, for, for 50 pounds. And then three over 50 would be the rental rate, the return on land for that land. Um, so it's that kind of construction. And what type of, I mean, this is like all over the place information or is it mostly yeah, like so, in London or what? Yeah, so, okay, so I, I can't quite remember all the details. It, the, the standard thing that, so this is also from Clark. And so a lot of our data is from Clark. And the standard thing Clark does is because there's all this, you know, one of the things you have to worry about in this kind of stuff is composition bias. That sometimes the data is coming from rich areas and sometimes the data is coming from poor areas if systematically in some periods the data is coming from london and some other periods it's coming from some backwater area that that would bias things Th this is something that is a concern in the real wage data in this data and lots of the data now the typical thing that clark does is that he runs a fixed effect regression so he has source fixed effects okay and then he's only looking at changes all right, so I have to admit that I don't remember exactly how this data is constructed, but that's definitely how he does it with the wages data. But I would have to go back and, and remind myself how he does it with this data. In some of these cases, obviously, the data is somewhat sparse, so it's, it's not obvious that he would be able to do it that way. But, but I have to go remind myself about that. But, you know, that kind of a thing, you know, if you're trying to do economics over 700 years, there's some messiness in the data, no question about it. Okay, finally, after 1760, we're going to use these two series. So this is the, this is the um, land rents, okay, and this is capital. Now, you can see capital is rising very rapidly from 250 to 1250 over this century. Land rents, on the other hand, are rising only modestly from 60 to 100. And that is suggesting when, when both the population and the capital stock are rising enormously, and land is not, the price of land is not increasing, it mu that, that is what leads us to infer that the usefulness of land is falling very rapidly in this period. You know, if this fixed factor was equally important over this period, its price should rise enormously um, 
because the quantity of the other factors is rising so rapidly. But its price is actually not rising very rapidly, and so we're going to infer that the land is becoming less and less useful uh, during this period. Okay, so we're going to use kind of fancy Bayesian methods to estimate this model. Let me not dwell on that unless any, somebody is interested in it. There are two things that this allows us to do, uh, or, or several things that it allows us to do easily. One is to uh, uh, allow for measurement error in all the data. It allows us also to kind of impute missing observations, and we can very easily allow for breaks. And, and what is kind of important for our analysis, or at least for expositing our analysis, is that we're going to allow for two breaks in the productivity parameters. The first break, we're going to just kind of impose that it occurs at the onset of the Industrial Revolution. So we're going to say, well, the Industrial Revolution happened. Let's, let's put a break at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So that's 1760. And then in addition to that, we're going to say, well, let's suppose that maybe, let's contemplate the notion that there may have been a break before the Industrial Revolution. And let's let the model tell us when that break may have occurred and whether that break was substantial. Okay, so we're gonna allow for one additional break prior to the Industrial Revolution and see if it actually is big and when it occurred. But what about what about breaks in the in the in the slope of, of the labor demand curve? Well, so we're gonna model that. Okay, so the the so that is going back to um, where was this? Um, so that is right here. Okay, so the slope of the labor demand curve is alpha. And after 1760, we're allowing alpha to change and we're estimating alpha based on you know, the data, the rental rate and so on. But prior to 1760, we're not allowing alpha to change. Okay, so that is a limitation of the analysis. Now, if you believe Clark's estimates of labor and land shares prior to the Industrial Revolution, he argues that they're fairly stable. Now, we have some qualms with the way he calculates that, so I don't want to put too much weight on that. But you know, if you think the economy was, was not undergoing radical transformation prior to the Industrial Revolution in terms of these factor shares, then that's an okay assumption. But that's clearly a limiting thing. That we're, we're, we're saying alpha is constant prior to 1760, but we're allowing it to change very radically after 1760. Okay, so um, let me skip over exactly how we model these breaks um, in the interest of time and just tell you what, I, what we get. Okay, so here's the posterior probability of when these, the, this earlier break. So there's one break in 1760, and then we're allowing for the idea that there may have been a break prior to that, and we're asking the model when did that, you know, if there was another break, when did it occur? And these are the probabilities. Okay, so the spike in probability is in 1600. So the model seems to want a break in 1600. And you can see that a pretty substantial amount of probability mass is prior to the Civil War, and an even larger amount of probability mass is prior to the Glorious Revolution, which is occurring around here. So our model really seems to suggest that it's 1600 as opposed to 1640 or, or 1690. That is the time of the breaks. Now we can actually run a horse race between 1600 and the Industrial Revolution by, by estimating a model with only one break. Okay, so let's, let's just say there's only one break, and, and it can be at the Industrial Revolution, it can be at 1600, and what does that look like? Well, if there's a single break, then yes, the model says, well, with some probability that a break occurred around the time of the Industrial Revolution, but actually with bigger probability, if there's only one break, we want to put it in 1600. Okay? So I think that's kind of cool. But it's also kind of impressive, no? Like there's something going on that make a bigger, what's sort of more likely to make a bigger change than the industrial revolution. Yeah, so, so in productivity, okay? In productivity, so like, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, so even in this analysis, of course, I am, I am allowing the factor shares to start changing. So that is kind of, if, if you want to think about what is so right. radically yeah. different about the industrial yeah. revolution, and I think one answer to that is that, that perhaps the most radically transformative thing about the Industrial Revolution is that it relaxes this land constraint. Prior to that, there had been periods of, of, of technological innovation and so on, but the economy always ran into this land constraint. Okay, the, the production of energy was so land intensive 
that if you wanted to, even if you have great ideas to produce a lot of stuff, you need a lot of energy. And it just like, you ran out of land. Okay. Cause you needed to like feed your animals. They were going to like turn whatever machine you were making. Okay. But with the introduction of the steam engine, that land constraint gets lifted. And that is radically, you know, transformational. And the economy can start growing even without any productivity growth or with some modest productivity growth, it can start growing enormously. Okay, so, yeah. so with that analysis, we get to, you know, we estimate a, a series for productivity. I've shown you this series before. It has some modest fluctuations prior to 1600 and then starts growing. Now, the thing that's kind of a little bit more interesting is to compare our series for productivity, which is the black line here, with a series for real wages, which, you know, if you're kind of a simple-minded approach as well, productivity is just like real wages. And then you would infer that productivity had these huge swings prior to 1600, but, but we're seeing productivity having much smaller amplitude swings prior to 1600 than the real wage. And that's, you know, obviously because the, the population is, is, is moving around a lot. Now, after 1600, actually, the opposite is occurring. Real wages are moving less than productivity. Okay, and that's also interesting. Okay, so there's, there's a lot of discussion about what's often called Engels pause. Okay, there's a period at the onset of the Industrial Revolution when wages are not rising. And so the traditional kind of Marxian point of view is, well, the capitalists are taking all the fruits of, of this, all this innovation and the laborers are not getting anything, okay? And, and so, so people kind of talk about capitalism as being terrible because real wages are not rising um, during this period in the early Industrial Revolution. Now, our analysis provides a different explanation for this, okay? So this is a period where the population is exploding and since the economy is still pretty Malthusian, the fact that the population is exploding is putting downward pressure on the marginal product of labor. And so you can have a lot of productivity growth and, and the population is, if anything, falling. And that's all for these Malthusian reasons that, the, that the, the pop, you know, this massive population growth is, is, is putting downward pressure on, on um, the marginal product of labor. So basically we, we provide a, uh, a different explanation for Engels' pause than the traditional kind of uh, uh, Marxian explanation. Now, at some point, productivity growth gets big enough, and the economy is no longer as Malthusian. You know, as the land share falls, the economy is getting less and less Malthusian, and and so um, wages start to, to to rise a lot, and that's happening in the 19th century. Here's our estimate of, of, of the land share. So prior to the onset of the Industrial Revolution, we estimate a very large land share, 38%. And then it falls very rapidly over these uh, first 100 years. Of course, you know, we know that it continued to fall. And at the moment, the land share is close to zero. Um, but even in those first 100 years, it's fallen from 38 to about 18. Okay? And this is showing you where that land share is going. This is the capital share. According to our estimates, it's, it's not an increase in capital share. All of this stuff is an increase in the labor share, actually. I just kind of, that was surprising to me, actually. John, can now, you, mm -hmm. sorry, a, a quick question. So can you, can you go even further, like into the 20th century uh, to sort of see how these things map into other things that people have estimated with more standard data later on? Well, okay, so I think, so, you know, we're estimating a Malthusian model. And, and there, there are kind of two elements of a Malthusian model that are important. One is the fixed land and the fact that the land share is appreciable. Okay? The other important element of a Malthusian model is the, is the labor supply side. The fact that if real wages rise, that increases population growth. Now, that actually starts the change in the late 19th century. So from 1850 to 1900, that relationship between real wages and population growth breaks down. You have what's called um, the demographic transition. Okay, the, the birth rates start falling a lot, even though people are richer and richer. The, I think I have a picture of this somewhere. Uh, the birth rates um, start falling a lot. Uh, yeah, here. Okay, so here's the this picture is uh, black is birth rates, 
gray is death rates, okay? And so here in this part, you see the kind of Malthusian thing. People are getting richer and the birth rates are rising. People are getting richer and the death rates are falling. And so there's opening up this enormous population growth. But then eventually something changes and this Malthusian relationship just totally breaks down, okay? And you have this demographic transition, the birth rates start plummeting. So I think our model, once you enter into the kind of the period after 1870 or 1880, you know, you would have to radically change the model and you wouldn't want to use the type of analysis that we that we're doing. OK, so I think I mentioned this before, if I had not allowed alpha and beta to change then I would have ascribed much more of the growth in the last 100 years to productivity. I would have seen a much, so here I'm re-estimating the model with constant alpha and beta throughout, and I get a lot more productivity growth in the last 100 years. So this is basically saying that by allowing alpha and beta to change in the last 100 years, the growth that we're seeing in the economy in the last 100 years is not being attributed to productivity growth, it's being attributed to this um, kind of lifting of, of, of the constraint imposed by land um, in the earlier period. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to talk about is this, this idea of uh, persistent periods of prosperity. Okay, so historians are, um, are often very negative about kind of economists talking about Malthusian stuff. And, and so sometimes like you can read things where they're like, they're extremely kind of, you know, the, the, the language they use is extreme in terms of their negativ negativity. And usually what it boils down to is they say, well, there were these periods of persistent product of, of prosperity prior to the Industrial Revolution. How can this be consistent with, you know, um, us humans behaving like, um, you know, rabbits where we just have babies and babies and babies and babies. Um, and, and so, you know, they point to things like Greece and Rome and Song China, the Dutch, Dutch Golden Age, the Islamic Golden Age, and so on. Um, and so we wanted to think about whether, you know, these episodes are consistent with our model. And actually, they are, okay? So because you can have this kind of very extreme, naive, um, way of thinking about a Malthusian model where the Malthusian forces are so strong that you're always fully stuck at, at subsistence wages. But, but if you move away from that and make the Malthusian forces a bit weaker, then the model is much more interesting. Okay, and that's, I think, more realistic. So in a Malthusian model, first of all, a Malthusian model does not imply that productivity growth is zero. That's just a separate thing, okay? But, and if you have a Malthusian model with productivity growth that's non-zero, then you have two forces. You have a persistent force raising real wages, which is the fact that productivity is increasing. And then you have a persistent force pushing down real wages, which is that there's more and more people, which is, um, which is pushing, uh, putting downward pressure on the marginal product of labor. Now, for any constant level of productivity growth, there's gonna be some level where these forces are in equilibrium. So the real wage in a Malthusian model is a function of productivity growth. And the higher is productivity growth, the higher is the steady state real wage in a Malthusian model. So if, the, if productivity growth is zero, then you might have a very low steady state real wage. But if productivity growth is, is higher, the steady state real wage is gonna be higher. And the steady state real wage depends on productivity growth, but it also depends on the strength of the forces pushing down, okay? And in our model, the forces pushing down are governed by these two parameters. Alpha is the land share, and gamma was this elasticity of the population growth res with respect to uh, real income, okay? And so we estimate both of these things. And so I've talked already about alpha, so we estimate that to be 0.38. But let me now talk about gamma, which is this elasticity of population growth with, with respect to real income. So we estimate that to be 0.09, so that's a fairly small number. Um, now, interestingly, it's highly statistically significant, okay? even though it's very small. So, the Malthus so one reaction to our paper is, well, you're estimating that there were no Malthusian forces. No, that's not quite right. The Malthusian forces are there, they're very small, 
but they're quite statistically significant. Okay, so we can reject zero pretty strongly. Okay, but still the estimate is quite small. And that means that this force that's pushing wages down is weak. Okay, and so one of the implications of that is that if you do have a plague, it takes the it takes the, the economy hundreds of years to kind of recover from the plague because these forces are so weak. Okay, but it also implies that if you have any appreciable productivity growth, then you can get a pretty substantial increase in real wages. So if, for example, Rome had productivity growth of say 3% per decade for a few hundred years, that would mean that wages would rise in Rome by a pretty appreciable amount. And it wasn't until like they had risen quite a bit that that this other force would be able to totally undo it okay so you can through the lens of this model it, it it's not very surprising that wages in rome were maybe two to five or even ten times higher than wages in some other period because the malthusian force is so weak and so here's a picture of this okay so this is what i'm showing you here in this picture is so what i have alpha on the, the strength of these Malthusian forces are, are a function of the land share. They get stronger, the bigger is the land share. Um, and so I have alpha, the land share, on the x-axis. And then on the y-axis, I'm showing you the steady state real wage relative to the steady state real wage with zero productivity if productivity has some other value. Okay, so say, for example, we estimate a productivity of 3% per decade, and we estimate uh, uh, an alpha of 0.38, so we would have real wages of about two times what they would have been, steady state real wages of about two times what they would have been um, if, if there was no productivity growth. Oh, sorry. Now, but you know, if, if, if productivity growth was a bit higher, then you can easily get steady state real wages that are five or six or even, you know, a little bit higher than that. Um, um, than they would be if there was no productivity growth. Okay, that's with a very high land share. Now, once the land share starts falling and you're into the industrial era, then like you can basically get real wages to be extremely high because these Malthusian forces get even weaker. Okay, so you know once the once there's the onset of the industrial revolution, you know this is basically saying we could have had an enormous amount of real wage growth even without uh, the demographic transition. Okay, so that's that's it. Um, I think I'm right on time to give you guys 15 minutes to talk um, um, after the seminar. You know, basically what we do is we we pr produce this new estimate of productivity growth in England using a Malthusian model from 1250 to 1860. We argue that there was no productivity growth prior to 1600. Productivity growth started in 1600. It was relatively modest early on. It sped up during the Industrial Revolution, but not as much as you may have thought. And that's because a lot of the growth in the economy uh, during the Industrial Revolution had to do with a fall in the land share as opposed to an increase in productivity. Great. Thanks a lot, uh, John, for the presentation and for, for being mindful of the time. So we have uh, some minutes for further discussion. So just feel free to step in and, and ask questions or comments in the comments. Hey, John, this is Mario from the bank too. Um, I have a question. Uh, I'm not a really big history buff, so maybe it's completely out of place. Uh, but seeing that you're using estimates from 1250 to 1860, uh, how do you incorporate slavery? Or if that is a topic that you that is not important in the model? I don't know. No, of course. Uh, so especially related to the fact that I uh, was asked before about the imperial the Imperial Britain that also brought land, but also brought uh, slaves. Yeah, okay, so so let's think about um, domestic labor institutions in England, okay? So obviously I'm making a somewhat heroic assumption that wages are equal to the marginal profits of labor, okay? If there's labor coercion um, during this period, and arguably there was, there were a lot of serfs and there was feudalism and so on, then you might have thought that wages were below the marginal product of labor. Now, if that were a constant, I could put in a constant in that equation and that wouldn't change anything. But what is argue, you know, most likely happening during this period is that there was more labor coercion early in the period 
than later in the period. Early in the period, it's very feudal. There are a lot of serfs. They have very little bargaining power. Uh, they're treated very badly. And over time, labor coercion in England is, is falling. Okay? So if that's the case, then, you know, that is going to be in my A. Okay? That's one of these things that is in the residual. It, you know, I think that's probably happening fairly slowly. So it's probably going to be fairly modest in any given decade, even though maybe over hundreds of years, it may matter quite a bit. You know, it's plausible to me that wages were only half of the marginal product of labor at the beginning, and maybe they were 80% at the end, or, you know, ballpark something along those lines. And so maybe I'm missing a factor of something like that. And, and, and I'm, I would be overstating true productivity growth because part of it would be a reduction in uh, the uh, in labor coercion during the period. Now, now, the now it's important in thinking about the that question to think about exactly what real wage series I'm using. Okay, so I am using not, you know, farm workers or and definitely not serfs. Okay, so it's even hard to think about the wages of serfs. Okay, I'm using building workers that are building cathedrals and so stuff like that. So arguably those guys, now if there's a historian in the audience, maybe they're going to disagree, but I think it's correct to say that those guys face less labor coercion than the serfs out in the countryside. So it may be that I'm capturing kind of the wages of, of kind of the freest people during my sample, okay? I, I think this is a very interesting point. It's possible to have some sense, at least in some part of the history, the difference between wages of the workers in the in the building industry is a bit the land workers, because that could be one of the reasons, for example, if you believe that's uh, that the land owner have the all the bargaining power. So you have, they take all the, the surplus that when there are people dying, and this is the reason why the Malthusian force is so weak, because they are taking a lot of part of the of the surplus, the initial surplus after a shock. Let's assume they have a black, half of the population die, the wages of the rest of the people jump, but this guy take all the surplus. So the, the effect on the Malthusian part that's, that will start to increase the again the the, the 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 population will be very weak because the large part of the surplus is taken by the landowners, for example. So I think that is, I think that is quite plausible. So let me say a few things now. You know, I'm going to argue back, but I'm still quite sympathetic to what you're saying. Okay, so several things I can argue back is, first of all, Greg Clark has a series for farmers. And this is, is the gray line here is the series for farmers. Now, I don't know. It looks very similar to the builders. Okay. Now, do I totally believe that series? I'm not quite sure. We chose not to use it as our baseline series because maybe we are not as comfortable with it. Okay. But that's what he estimates. Okay. So that's one thing. A second thing is, you know, in the history of the, of the fall of feudalism in England, the fall of feudalism really is very associated with the Black Death. So there's a lot of feudalism. Then Black Death kills a lot of people. There's obviously an enormous amount of land that is basically not being very heavily used after that because there aren't enough people to farm all this land. And so the lords are competing for workers. People, there wasn't basically for some reason that I don't really know, the lords in England, they didn't manage to create a fugitive serf law. You know, in America, there was a fugitive slave law at some point, okay? But in England, they didn't manage to do that. So basically what happened was if you could manage to escape your, you know, manor, then you were all of a sudden free. You could go to the next door feudal lord and say, hey, can I work for you? And then you would work for that guy as a free person. And it was this that led to the kind of feudalism broke down because there was so much of this. Everybody was basically escaping their feudal lord and becoming free. And, 
150 years later, there was basically very little true feudalism left, okay, in the, in the sense of having true serfs. That doesn't mean that there's no labor coercion, okay? But, but, but that is kind of a big part of the history that I agree that certainly right after the Black Death, these guys are trying to hang on to their, to their surplus, and that probably worked for a while. But I think the historians would say that that eventually got eroded, and that's why these real wage series rise so much, even if they don't rise very much right after the Black Death, they eventually rise a lot because eventually the workers capture more of the surplus. Hey, John, uh, I have a small question. Um, could there be any, I was thinking just in the, during that period, uh, weather shocks that would affect land utilization and maybe at the end it would affect your estimate of the you back up. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's totally possible that there are weather shocks. And so weather shocks would be labor demand shocks in our model. So they would be a part of the A. Okay, so there's some, I don't, I'm actually not fully, I don't remember all the details, but there's some notion of a little ice age and stuff like that. So, so there is variation in weather. Um, and I think that would be part of the A, to the extent that weather obviously affects productivity and agriculture. So, so yeah. That would be a part of A. Thanks. May I? Mm -hmm. could, could you go to slide 30, please? No, and, and this is in the, you're in the appendix. Oh, this is in the appendix, sorry. Um, yes. Slide 30. Uh, yeah. So I, uh, I think this is like, or more broadly, the comparison between uh, your way to compute productivity related to Clark's give you an opportunity to tease out the uh, some mechanism that may be stronger uh, quantitatively than others. So, for instance, I can imagine that one exercise you could perform would be to take your model and probably take out all the bells and whistles, and then you could replicate the same uh, Type of methodology used by Clark, and then in adding uh, the uh, new ingredients, because basically my understanding that what you're saying is that glass methodology is misspecified because they're not taking into account the Malthusian part, uh, the Malthusian endogeneity of labor supply. No, no, no. no not, I don't think that's quite right. Okay, so if he had perfect data, the dual approach would work. Even you know, he's he's you know. You can apply the dual approach that is his approach in a Malthusian economy. It's just that you need correct data. Okay? Yeah. So that's so his, the like, wages, his... for instance. The, they take the, the 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 series of wages and you are adjusting the series of wages. Well, no, no, no. no. We're, we're, you, we're using essentially the same series of wages. So the, the thing, you know, we've worked on yeah. this a lot, okay? Because he's, you know, he's been yeah. a referee on our paper. Um, and um, there are kind of two things that, that play a big role in in this okay so one is that if he if he has a different alpha than we do a different land share so that's mm -hmm. in our language a different so in his in his um way of thinking about it it's a it's a different land share in our way of thinking about it it's a different slope of the labor demand curve and so if i go back to that picture at the very beginning this um this one you know, if the alpha is wrong, if the alpha makes the labor demand curve too uh, not steep enough, then you're going to get this movement up and movement down, which is what he gets. Okay, so part of what's going on in his analysis is that he has a land share that is that is much lower than ours, and that's why his productivity series looks more like the wage before 1600. Now, the other thing that's going on is that he, you know, our model implies something about the price of land prior to 1760. And, and he has some data on, the, on, the, on, on land rents, okay? Sorry, the land rents, not price of land, land rents. Um, and so we think that the series that he's using for land rents probably is not correct, okay? So, so it's very noisy. And probably that is playing some role. The 
the, the land rents that are implied by our model. Okay, so these are the land rents that are implied by our model. Okay, so in particular, as you would expect, you know, our model infers that land, you know, was yielding much less right after the Black Death because there were no people to work on the land, so you couldn't really rent it for very much. Okay, the other thing is that land rents, according to our model, are rising quite a bit in this period. Both of these things are a bit different than in his series. Okay, so here's our series is the gray and, and the black is his series. Like he doesn't have any fall, you know, it's just like you go right through the great, the black death and as, no, as though nothing is happening. And then over here, you know, we have a bigger increase from here to here, we have a bigger increase. These are two things that are playing a big role in our results being different from his. Okay, and, and then it's up to you. Do you believe his data? We're using a model, you know? Sometimes one is, you know, favors data over a model, but, um, but we think this series kind of looks a little weird and, and, um, and arguably has a lot of measurement error in it. Okay, thanks. Somebody had yeah. a hand up, yeah. Oh, is, is there anyone else? I thought somebody had a hand up. Um, no, I haven't seen anything. No. Okay. 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 Uh, John, thanks a lot. I think we're right on time. Um, thanks okay. everyone for participating and asking questions. And thanks, John, for the for the talk. Uh, please stay online for uh, we're gonna go back to the practice session. And oh, everyone great. else, uh, uh, stay tuned for next week's uh, webinar. There was a question from Carlos Madeira. Oh. Okay, let me see where Carlos is. As attendee. I think I put him now on the panelist. I don't know why he wasn't on the panelist. Carlos, are you there? Yes. Uh, hi, yes. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, John Steinson about uh, this the result with the land shares whether the land share could have changed due, due to the discovery of the new world. Because after 1600, I don't know, maybe some industries like agriculture, well, part of the textile industry with the cotton uh, production moved to the United States. And maybe that could have changed the, this parameter of the land share, share gradually over time. Yeah, I, I think that is plausible now. Um, I and, and, you know, so I, <clears throat> I think that's plausible. Um, now, England did not import a lot of food until fairly late in our sample, you know, mm -hmm. so it's not until kind of the 18th century that imports of food are, are playing a big role. Um, also, the, you know, the cotton industry is something that kind of takes off more in the late 18th century as opposed to around 1600. So, you know, I was comfortable with allowing alpha change in, six, in 1760 to capture most of what you're talking about. Um, but, you know, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm somewhat sympathetic to the fact that it might, might change a bit earlier than that. Um, you know, to the extent that that happens, it's going to be captured by A, you know, basically we're saying that they have this technology to plunder other areas. Um, and that would be part of A in our analysis. 